Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Street Peace Coalition on CAN TV, Channel 21 on Chicago uh, Comcast stations. My name is Minister Michael Muhammad. I am the co founder of the Street Peace Coalition. We are a grassroots um, community based, community oriented violence intervention prevention organization. We focus on um, black on black violence and peripheral issues related to violence in the black community. Uh, we have been working under the uh, auspices of the Street Peace Coalition for the last six or seven years. And so this is our way of reaching out to you and allowing us uh, to hear from you with your ideals, your thoughts, your suggestions, and also for us to appeal to those of you who have a um, deep concern for violence in the black community uh, to give you an opportunity, perhaps, to make an investment back into the community by partnering with our organization, by joining our organization, by sponsoring some of the activities of our organization in whatever way your heart may be moved uh, by viewing our weekly broadcast. And so we want to thank those of you who are regular viewers who frequently call in and those of you who may be viewing us for the first time. Uh, we want to thank you for tuning in. Uh, as I said, uh, each week we try to raise some particular uh, um, issue related to violence and we think about the root causes of violence we try to look at the driving uh, forces behind the violence and so I think I'll start tonight by mentioning a recent study uh, done by the American Psychiatric Association this particular study is a study done where the respondents, the results of the study showed that the respondents to the study generally viewed a man, an American male, as more menacing, more threatening, more dangerous if he was black versus all other perceived, um, uh, I'll say, ethnicity or race. So according to the American uh, Psychiatric Association and its study, that most uh, Americans view black men as more menacing, more dangerous, more threatening, and so the view, the general view of black men in America is that we are dangerous, we're menacing, we're threatening, and we're violent. Uh, coinciding with that, I, I saw another uh, report on British television where a group of sociologists, I believe, in the United Kingdom uh, showed images to white participants. The images they showed were first of white uh, images, white people who were going to work or jogging or uh, doing random acts and they were given a chance to interpret those acts and they interpret those acts in the most constructive positive way and then they cast the images with black people doing this exact same activity and the respondents or participants were given a chance to respond and give it an interpretation of the same activity, same images, only this time with black in people in the image. And down to a person, they interpreted those images as being something nefarious, something illegal, something illicit, or something dangerous. And so this is a running theme that has a direct impact on violence. It has a di direct impact on criminal justice. It has a direct impact on the self-esteem, the worthiness that um, 
we as black people see ourselves as and the unworthiness that people outside of our group view us as being unworthy of certain considerations, certain benefits of the doubt, and a certain level of treatment. And so I'm going to come back to that in a second. I see we have a caller. Is the caller on the air? Caller, are you there? You know? Yes, go ahead, caller. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. All right, my friend. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I call almost every week. All right. Thank you. But you know what? But you know what this means? A couple of days ago, it might have been yesterday, here I, here I see my, my mayor crying on TV again. He usually cries after 100, 150 black men or Hispanic men are killed. Then he gets on TV, he cries, but guess what? I'm going to get, I'm going to start a new commission. Three, four hundred more people killed, a young baby killed. Same thing. I'm going to get a commission, and I'm crying. So when I saw him crying yesterday, every time he cried, then you know, you know he don't care. And that's a bad thing to say. He don't care about nothing. He's just in the ivory tower because he has all of us. All of us, he's asking. All of the aldermen, both black and Hispanic, vote with him all the time. How are we going to get out of this program if we don't put new people in? And you, sir, should be the first one to run. Or something. But I'd, I'd go in, I'm 69 years old, and I'd go to your headquarters and help you. And I'm Catholic, I don't care. You're the man for job. Because I know all that BS ain't going to be there for long. Everything else, this city, my beautiful city of Chicago, is going to hell. And men like you, real men, could really help out. You guys would make them run for it, and I've had me and my friends helping you out there. Thank you. Uh, thank you, caller. Uh, for those of you who couldn't hear, he made comments about the fact that the mayor at an event on yesterday, I believe, is the event he's referring to at the DuSable Museum of uh, African American or Black History on the south side of Chicago. Made, the mayor hosted a, an event uh, proclaiming Chicago a welcoming city. They've changed the language from a sanctuary city because of threats from the federal government. And so he invited many uh, Spanish-speaking people there to uh, embrace his message and his stance that Chicago is a welcoming city. And so in his remarks, he began to cry about his father and the journey his father took to arrive in America as an immigrant. And so uh, the caller is suggesting that the cries of the mayor uh, appear to be disingenuous when you contrast them with the actual policies and practices <laughs> of the Rahm Emanuel administration. Unfortunately for our city, I, I tend to agree with the caller. Uh, I don't know what role crying plays in his communication, but I do know the effect of his practices and his policies. In fact, he uses caller if you listen you're listening still listening and looking he uses our communities the black community and the spanish speaking community he uses us against one another and yesterday's event was another step in that direction he understands that Black people, the black community supported him politically overwhelmingly. In fact, twice, really. But the Laquan McDonald unmasked the brutality that goes on in Chicago. This is not new, 
but it unmasks some uh, ugly things about the way the city is operating, and he knows there's a there's 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 a lot of discontent with with his leadership, and so we have to understand our communities have to mature in our relationships with one another. We have to have honest conversations. And we have to understand that we have some differences and those differences are quite often brokered in a way to keep us divided against one another because if we come together, we represent a, a, a absolute super majority in this city. And so I, I believe that that, uh, event yesterday and the whole agenda with it is primarily in a, a strategy to accumulate votes from the Spanish-speaking communities to replace the loss of votes in the black community. And so I'm not sure. I personally am very suspect of not only Rahm Emanuel's concern, but I'm very suspect of the superintendent and his administration at 35th in Michigan, the police department headquarters, the brass, I'm very suspicious about their thinking of how to treat uh, violence and crime in general when it comes to black and brown people. And so this is a political uh, situation that does require strong people this is the problem with black elected officials. It is not that they're, they are not good people. Most of them seem to be basically fundamentally good people. But as I said to someone earlier today, the problem is we are so immature about power and power politics that we don't understand that it takes more than just a good person to represent you in the halls of political power. It takes people with courage. It takes people with tenacity. It takes people who are strong and uncompromising in their advocacy for the fair treatment, the rights to bring justice and equality for their constituency, it takes people who are not only good, but they don't have fear. They don't have a hidden sense of inferiority. They don't feel as though they owe the mayor something simply because he is the mayor. It, it takes a unique person, and normally those are not the people who hold elective office. They do a little good, and the rest they compromise. So as the caller said, most of our elected officials, black and brown, have a over 95% rate of voting uh, in line with the mayor regardless of the practice and policy. And in this case, regardless of what impact it has on the vicious cycle of violence that seems to permeate our communities. And so as I was saying before the uh, caller uh, called, I was uh, 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 articulating um, these two uh, studies, one by the American Psychi Psychiatric Association and another by, uh, I forget the institution in the United Kingdom, um, but they produced a video that you will be able to see online, it's, uh, it's on social media. Um, where the views of black and brown people, especially black people, the darker you are, the more dangerous you're perceived to be. The, the, our, the black community in general, when it comes to non-blacks in power, view us as a threat. And so if you have this kind of subconscious, this kind of unconscious thinking, bias, permeating your brain, what kind of policies, if you are a power person, if you're an elected official, if you're a policy maker, if you are a legislator, what kind of policies and practices will come out of you if generally you have this kind of thinking that a person is a danger just because of the complexion or the tone of their skin? If you are a police officer, 
if you're in law enforcement, if you're a prosecutor, even if you're a, a, a public defender, if you are a, um, a deputy sheriff and you're guarding prisoners or you work in uh, IDOC and corrections, these are the dominant perceptions, the dominant prejudices. We've been prejudged to be criminals even when we have done nothing wrong. And so Channel 2 News recently went inside the county jail, Cook County Jail, and looked at the prison population and interviewed Sheriff Tom Dart, who admitted that a minimum of 50% of the prisoners in Cook County Jail are there for two reasons. They're there because they're poor and they're there because they're black or brown. So when this is the dominant bias in our social structure, when it permeates government at every level, when it permeates the institutions of government, fire, police, and all of the other departments, then how can a community of people uh, not be victimized by, the, by this dominant thought, this dominant negative perception of a whole community of people based upon the color of their skin? So if you compile or, or compound that in the black and brown community with the fact that we have also been infected by this mind virus, most of us do not think well of ourselves. Most of us have learned to loathe ourselves. We have been socialized and miseducated in a way that we have deep self-loathing. In other words, when we look in the mirror, we really feel uncomfortable. We feel frustrated. We feel a sense of anxiety. We, we feel a sense of disappointment. We feel even a sense of hatred just because of the way we look when we see ourselves in the mirror. And so this frustration, this anxiety, this self-rejection, it plays itself out when you compound that with miseducation, when you compound that with uh, uh, poverty, when you compound that with a lack of opportunity for economic mobility, when you compound that with neighborhoods that have been destabilized by economic violence, now you have a people who strike out and demonstrate violence toward one another in a way that is not natural and not normal. But it is not something that we come out of the womb with, it is the byproduct of a deep social construct, a deep social engineering that has an impact on non, on, on black people and it has an impact on non-blacks. And so it plays itself out as uh, the, the end result, the byproduct is either black on black violence or institutional racism that is uh, perpetrated through economic, educational, and other forms of social violence, uh, which play itself out as police brutality. We have a caller. Go ahead, caller. Yes, uh, th this is me again. I, I called you earlier. Yes, sir. You know, I, 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 I agree with you about the alderman just a little bit because, listen, if, they, if this was the first year in there, the second year in there, but it's not. It's the fifth, sixth, seventh year in there. Now they think they're white. Do what, do what the white man says on top and just go along with it and you'll have a job. And what do they do every four years? Go out there, hand out a little bit of money, hand out some turkeys, hand out this and that, and they, got, and they have a, you know, their vote. These guys aren't doing anything. So please. So you can't tell me that they're doing the job. They're not doing the job. Because if they were doing the job, this city would be one hell of a city. Not just the black all of them, it's fine respect the South. They have to, there's a bunch of us together. And like you said earlier, if we got together, we'd run City Hall. But no, we take a few dollars, give out a few dollars, and we're happy. 
Man, come on. We could do better than that, Chicago. Please, do better than that. And Ram, thank you. If one wants to cry, that's it. You know who's lying. Thank you. Thank you, caller. I agree with the caller. Uh, they're certainly not doing their jobs, but when you have a job that requires courage and you have no courage, when you have a job that requires that you take pride in uh, representing a constituency, but you lose your sense of pride in the face of another uh, person who you view as superior to you and your constituency, then you are paralyzed from being effective in the office to which you've been elected because these emotions produce a thought pattern, a way of being that neutralize your effectiveness in the job. And so if you are an appointee, if you have been selected by a political machinery that has placed you in office to serve its, its whims and its needs, then you don't do your homework. You don't do your research. You don't examine practices and policies. You, 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 don't, you don't stomp the neighborhood and talk to people. and You, you really don't have a, a, a posture of service to your constituency. You're serving the powers that be. And this is the problem when we talk about violence, is that everybody wants the status quo. The gangs want the status quo. The police want the status quo. Uh, the political powers want the status quo. And we are not having open, honest conversations about the nature of this violence and the things that are driving this violence, such as uh, the American Psychiatric Association pointed out this uh, institutional racism that most of us, if not all of us, have been infected by in Chicago and in America in general. Well, we're out of time, good people. I want to thank all of you who listen. Uh, I want to thank the callers who called in. We hope that you will tune in to us uh, next week, next Monday. We'll be right back on air here at Com Comcast uh, uh, Hotline 21. Uh, uh, we look forward to speaking to you on uh, uh, next Monday at 5 o'clock. Thank you.